we were at line nine. So this is from Anglo-Saxon, one of the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, right? That recorded what happens in a year, right? Uh, throughout various monasteries in England. And we were at line nine, right? So let's continue with line nine. So um, let's see, I'm looking for the pointer. Um, line nine, so this is N, right? Seven is N, right? Seven is N because it looks like a T, right? E-T, E-T et is a uh, Latin word for at, right? So at, and then S-O-N-E is soon or at once, right? Soon or at once, right? So here we are, soon or at once. And then the, right, the chosen, this is chosen, right? Chosen is chosen, chosen, right? C here is pronounced as C-H, right? Uh, abbot, abbot is uh, a rank of priest, right? The chosen abbot, uh, fur day is went, right? So went, seven here again is and, right? And the monks, right, the monks, T-E is D, right? The monks, munikes is monks with an S, plural. And the monks, with him is with him, right? With him to Oxford, to the king, right? Went with him to Oxford to the king, and seven is an, right? And he, next word is, EF is gave, right? He gave him, he gave him that abbot and then riche, the state of being an abbot. Riche is like, um, like the word ship, friendship, uh, noun forming suffix, right? The state of being an abbot, the rank of abbot, like that. Abbot, riche, so abbot plus riche, riche is a noun suffix. Uh, suffix like uh, it, ens, or ness like that, so it gives you the state of, right? And then line 10, going on line 10, he went, he went himself, right? He went himself, him is himself in this case because or else we cannot translate, right? Um, he went himself soon or at once to Lincoln, which is the name of the city, and was there, Bletchkett, which is ordained, right? We saw that before. And ordained to abbot, ordained is to, to go into monkhood, to become a monk. To, uh, ordained to abbot before, uh, air is before, before he home came, right? Before he came home. And then, and, and, right? And <coughs> sitten is afterwards. And afterward was, and afterward was under Fangen is received, right? He was received with, mid is with, Mitchell is great worship, we saw that before, with great worship at birth, another town. So he was received with great worship at birth. So people respected him, right? With Mitchell procession, with great procession, meaning they walk around, they march along, procession, right? So that's the, uh, that's the uh, Latin word, right, procession. And, right, seven is and, sua is so, right, so, the word so. Remember the W, uh, the W and U and V, they are interchangeable in, in spelling, and also uh, the W sound is going to to just fade away in Middle English, right? So, soa is so, the word so. So, and so, he was, also is also, also, right? So, he was also at Ramese, one of the towns, I think, and at Torn, one of the towns also, and at, and Spal, and at Sangte, one Beres. So, all of these are towns, right? So he was also at these towns. And, right, and nu is now, right? Nu is now. Now is abbot, and now he is an abbot. 
and fair. Fair meaning good, right? Fair meaning good or well. Fair, have, line 13, have, right? H-A-U-E-D is have. Bigunan began, right? So he has begun, began well, right? Bigunan. And then finally, we have, this is Christ, right? Christ. X is from the Greek, Greek letter. So X is Greek letter. Christ him unetas in. Christ to him. Christ to him gave that end. Christ, Christ to him gave that end. Please, like that. Christ, Christ gave that end to him, please, like that. Now, we finished the text, so we'll try to answer the questions here, right? So, question one, question one, comment on the spelling changes you see in this text. For example, the use of thorn. What about the use of thorn here? What do you see, the use of thorn? Where do you see the thorn here? Line one, do you see? This, and then the king, right? There, right, the word there, and... Line two also that, right? Tha, the king. So you see a lot of thorns there, right? So this means that the text is early Middle English, right? Because as you know, thorn will gradually change into a th, right? But here we see a lot of thorns, right? Which means that it's early Middle English text. Like this one, uh, let me circle. So thor thorn is here, thorn is here, the thorn is also here. Um, thorn is also here. So thorn is all over the place here, which means that it's an early English, early Middle English text, right? Because we know that thorn will change into th ultimately, right? But here we see a lot of thorn still, right? However, however, um, however, we, um, uh, let's see which example. Um, the king. You see line nine. Do you do you see line nine here? Chosan abbot forde te, right? T e te, right? So this one. It should be a thorn also, right? Uh, just to resemble the word d, right? So it should be thorn and e. However, in this case we have t e, right? T e, which means that there is a variation as to how you can spell the word T-H-E-D, right? One, one way is to use the thorn, and the other way is to use just a T, right? So there's a variation in that. Okay, so that's the thorn. And next one is what sound here? C, the letter C. What do you see the letter C? Uh, where do you see the letter C? C in, um, let's see. Uh, there is a word for king, but, oh, not, line eight. You see the word for king, line eight. Love of the king. You see, it's K, right, K, instead of a C. Because in Old English, it's a C, right? Old English is kinning like that. We saw that before, right? C-Y. However, now it has become a K already, right? It has become a K already. This is in line eight. However, in line seven, you see? In line seven, C-U. It's not C-H, right? It's not C-H. It should be C-H because we know that finally the T-hook sound will become C-H, but here chosen is just chosen, just here, right? Not C-H yet. So it's not consistent, right? Meaning that this has not reached the last stage of change, right? So you see a mix of, a mix of things, a mix of different ways to write to spell the same thing, right?
And there is also another C, which is COM, right? This is in line three. I circle it with red here, COM. This is what we would expect, right? Because it is from the ver verb KUMAN, which is to come, right? C before U doesn't change to K in Middle English, right? C before a back vowel doesn't change to K, right? C before a back vowel doesn't change to K. So this is what we would expect. I think that's about it for letter C. Uh, what's the next letter? SC. SC should change to HS, right? SH, right? Number six, line six, it it shows no change, right? SC should, the word should, S-H-O-U-L-D, should, which is what we have nowadays. It should be, in the final stage of change, it should be S-H, right? But here is S-C still. So it means that, again, it's an early Middle English text, right? Because we don't see the, the final stage of change. Um, number line eight also, uh, here, the word church. Chiriken, it should be church, C-H, right? It should be C-H, the word church. Finally, it will be spelled C-H-U-R-C-H, which is what we have. But here, it's still C, right? What else do we have? The, um, the yo, right, the yo. So this is in question one below, right, the yo. So the yo, do we see a yo here? Oh, we don't, right? We don't, but yo used to be here. Uh, and then what else? The G, do you see the G? Where's a word that, have, that has a G? Uh, let me see from here. Uh, what else do we have the G? <coughs> God, right? So God, where's this, right? So you don't see the yo, uh, you don't see the yo in here, right? Do you? You don't. So the yo, for example, here, uh, in Old English, it would be represented with a yo, right? Uh, the word year, it should be the yo. And then there's the word day, I remember. Line five, midwinter day, right? So it should be with a yo also in Old English. But now the yo has become either the G or, or just dropped, right? So line one, line five, the word day, and the word God in line three also, right? So here you see that they replaced the yo with a G or either drop it from the word day, for example. Uh, what else? The U and the V spelling, the U and the V spelling still, uh, there's no rule, right? Line eight, the word love, you have W, right? I mean, two U's, W. There are two U's here in line eight. And then in line 13, the word half, the first one, the word half, you also have one U, right? So there is no, no rule, right? There's no rule uh, when to use W or just U, and there's no V in here, right? So because it's an early Middle English text. Um, next one, long vowels, long vowels. Long vowels, we know that they would be represented in spelling with E at the end or with double, double vowel symbols, right? Um, here, you see the word good is still good. It's not G-O-O-D, right? So again, because it's a middle, uh, early Middle English text. So G-O-D-E is not G-O-O-D, right? Short and long air. The next one, this is question one. Short and long air. Do you see air 
in use in this text or not? The bow tie air. Do you see that a lot or no? We see that a lot in this text, right? In line one, the word year, you have the word was, you have in line two, the first word at, right? So air, air is used in this text, right? But we know that finally air will change to a, right? We know that that's the final stage because we studied it already. Now, let's look at the word that. Where's the word that? Um, there should be the word that because I, I remember seeing one which um, is not the air sound anymore. Um, let's see. Um, you see the word at, the preposition at in line 12? It's spelled with a, right? It's spelled with a. Whereas there is the same word at, but spelled with the bow tie. Um, I don't remember which, which line though. At, let's see. Uh, 12, uh, line two, at, right? <laughs> right in front of me. Right, at here and then at here, right? So you see that. With e even within the same text, even within the same text, you have variation as to how the word air, right? How the, how the symbol air should be spelled. This is the bow tie, this is just a, ah, right? But we know that a ah will finally, air will be, become a ah, finally. Um, let's see. And then long vowel u, right? Long vowel u should change to o, right? U should change to o in spelling. We know that because of the minims. <coughs> however, however, um, let's see. Um, the word monk, the u here is not m o n k, right? It's still a u. Again, because it's an early Middle English text. So I think at this point, what I can tell you is that depending on what um, period the text is from, you cannot expect a clean, uh, a clean evidence, a clean piece of evidence of all the changes that we study, right? All the changes that we study um, are the changes that ultimately that ultimately happens at the end of the Middle English period. Uh, so uh, this is a very early Middle English text. So you see even the same vowel is spelled like two ways or three different ways. So that's possible. So you cannot expect anything like clear cut uh, in Old English or Middle English text. Right? So these are the spelling. And then I think I have some other questions on the back. right? Um, comment on the use of articles in the prose text. What forms do you see? So, what forms do you see in, in the article? Uh, in, the, in terms of the use of articles here? You see that we, they use the, right? The, T-H-E-D, right? However, there is no say, say all that, if you remember. Say, say all that, right? So masculine, feminine, neuter. Remember, those things are demonstrative, right? Or articles in Old English. In here, there's no such thing, right? There's no such thing. There's no say or there's no say, right? So we know that say will change to the, finally. So this is that phase where it has already changed into the word the, right? And we see the word that in line two, right? We see the word that in line two. But that's what we expect though, right? We expect this to be a neutral, right? Neutral, neutral uh, article. And then just the form D to be the neutral article for both male and female nouns. And the article is not consistent either, right? 
is not like in modern English where you have to have an article if you have a countable noun. Because there are some countable nouns in here that, that uh, doesn't have, there's some, let's say, mm, there's a word for, like here in line seven, was there uh, bletchet to abbot? So it should be to the abbot, to the state of abbot, like that, right? In modern English, you guys know, right, that every countable noun must have an article, right? Every countable noun must have an article. But here, some, some countable nouns do have articles like the king here, but other countable nouns do not have an article, like the word abbot here, like um, maybe, um, let's see but good for the, for the fear of king, the earl. Mm. Other, no man was he, let's see. I think there's one more example that I spot, but uh, I don't remember what it is. Um, if there's one, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, let's see. Number three, show evidence of erosion of inflectional morphology. What does that mean? You know that full vowels become the schwa sound, right? Especially at the end of the word, which means that all the inflections will be spelled with an E at the end, sometimes with an N. You remember that, right? And you remember past tense of uh, verbs in Old English end with don. Remember that? So we can find uh, evidence that D-O-N is no longer D-O-N, but perhaps D, E, and N pronounced as a schwa, right? Or another example is the, um, let's see, the A-N ending. This is the infinitive ending of Infinitive ending of verbs in Old English, remember? Old English verbs end, infinitives end with a n, right? Old English infinitives end with a n. So if we no longer see a n, but it's, we know that it's an infinitive, then we know that there's erosion. There's the erosion of inflectional morphology. So let's find the evidence from the text. Mm, let's see. Here, this is number seven. It should be O-N, but here we have E-N, right? And what else? Mm, Eleven, Funken, right? It should be O-N, it should be O-N, and then thirteen, the word end. I'll use. Enden, it should be endan, a n infinitive, right? So seven, chusen, and then thirteen, e n should be a n because that should be an infinitive, right? And 11 also under Fangan should be O-N in Old English, but now it's E-N, right? Because of the reduction of the full vowel to a schwa. And the spelling is E, right? Next question is comment on the case markings and show specific evidence from the text. So case marking, it should be, it should be at the end of a noun or an adjective, right? It should be at the end of a noun or an adjective. Now let's see, the word king has no, has no marking because it's a nominative case. Nominative case doesn't have any ending, right? Nominative masculine in Old English. Um, let's see, which one does have the ending? 
Um, can you help me find um, the word king that has, that has an E at the end? King, the word king that has an E at the end. Uh, where is it? Line eight. Oh yes, of the king. You see, this one, it, it does have the E ending, right? It does have the E ending, whereas line one, the king doesn't have. Because in Old English, in Old English, nominative doesn't have anything, right? Nominative, masculine. But here is not the nominative case. Of the king is not the nominative case. So there's the remnant of E here, right? There's the remnant of he here. And line four also, with Mitchell, with great worship, with the E ending, right? This is not nominative case, with should be the dative case, right? There's the E ending. Um, here, the word Oxford, the word Oxford also, two is dative, right? Two is dative, there's the E ending, right? E ending, which is the remnant, which is a remnant of the case marking. If you compare the, the name Oxford, to other towns, number 10, Lincoln, there's no E ending. Number 12, at Tarn, there's no E ending. At Spal, no E ending, right? <coughs> so uh, I think that at this, ta is, at this period, uh, the E is going away. E meaning the inflectional ending of nouns, right? It's going away. So sometimes you see it mark it you see it's marked on the verb, but sometimes it's not marked on the, on the, on the nouns, right? Not, not verb, but noun. Let's see, what about pronouns? What about pronouns? Uh, that's question five. Comment on the use of pronouns in this text. For the pronouns in this text, we only see the third person pronouns, right? Only he, the, the male form, and there is this one, right? They, our circle. This is they. Right. Line two, he here is they, right? We, we, we only see two forms in this text. The masculine, masculine uh, singular, he. Right, masculine singular he, and also the, the line two, H I, which means they, right? They. So, what does this mean? It means that we know that the they form will be borrowed from Scandinavian. So we have the T H, right? T H E Y, T H E M, like that. However, here, H-I, H-I means that the TH form hasn't got here yet, right? The TH form hasn't got here yet. N line seven, <coughs> himself, I think that's also the pronoun, right? The self form, the self form, himself, himself. But in line 10, he went him soon. You don't have the himself here. So it's not consistent. Meaning in line seven, you see himself, but in line 10, you have just him, right? So the self form is not as consistent as, as modern English, right? I cut myself, he went himself to this place, and so on. So questions? So if I give you this on the final, can you do it or not? Why? Easy, right? So just find the evidence from the text. Just find the evidence on the text. And um, as I said, that um, Middle English, and we still have to talk about early modern English, right? So Middle English text and early modern English text are not as difficult as Old English text because other words are um, most of the words are words that you should be familiar with because as time passed by, we borrow from Latin, we borrow from French, which is what we have now. However, 
What's different is the way in which a word could be spelled and the way in which um, a word could be used. For example, the king here, there's th, but there's another one where there's no th like this, right? So you have to be flexible in terms of uh, your recognition of recognizing uh, all the variations that there can be, right? So uh, let's move now to today. So we finish Middle English. We'll uh, start, let's see, we'll start Early Modern English. OK, so we, we now start Early Modern English, which is the last period, the last significant period. So after this, we'll study um, American English and World Englishes, right? So this is the last, what you can call, the last historical period that we'll study. And again, there is no clear-cut point as to when early modern English started, right? There's no clear-cut point, just as there was no clear-cut point as to when Middle English started, right? Because people during those times will, no lo will, will, will certainly not think of uh, one day or one historical event as the beginning of you know, early modern English or middle English, right? So there's no clear-cut date. However, there are some key dates and events that would lead to a lot of changes in the language. So let's see those uh, dates and historical events. So the first thing that, um, there's one, there will be one question on the final here. Um, the first thing that affected, the first thing that affected the changes in the early modern English period was the printing press, right? So as you know, before, before this time, everything was carried out by hand, right? Meaning that when you want to copy a book, whatever it is, a Bible or uh, a piece of literature, how did you do it? You have to do it one by one, right? Hand, one person can do one book. For example, however, when you, when uh, this guy William Caxton in 1476, when William Caxton brought the first printing press from the continental Europe to England, over to England, and it looked like this, right? So this is the printing press. So you can produce, you can mass produce, you can mass produce books, right, at a faster rate, right? Uh, you can perhaps. Uh, print 100 books, right, in one hour, for example, right? So this is the first printing press that was brought to England by William Caxton. So by 1500, you have about uh, 35,000 titles in Europe. That's a lot, right? That's a lot of books, considering that age. And in 1640, uh, by 1640, you have 20,000 titles in English than um, in England, right? So. That means that a lot of people had access to reading, right? So literacy here, you see, literacy increase, right? Increase because now books can be printed for a cheap price, for a lower price, right? So people who didn't have a lot of money before can buy book now, right? They can buy books now. And literacy increase because if people had access to books, then it means that they could read, right? Or they try to read. So literacy, meaning that the knowledge of how to read and write, literacy increased significantly in this period. Price went down, right? The price of the book went down because you can mass produce it. So if it's a mass production, then it can spread ideas quickly and faster also, right? <coughs> And the middle classes, uh, they wanted information. They wanted to read in English for a long time. And now is the time for them, right? Because you have the printing press, right? The middle classes who didn't have the means to buy books before. And before it takes time, right? Before, it, it, before this, it took time to, to copy books, but now no. And, um, the London dialect here means that when you print a book, every copy is the same, right? When you print a book, every copy is the same. And the first printing press was brought to England in London, to London, right? Which means that the London dialect 
was chosen to be the form that represents all the words. So the London dialect became the standard of written English, right? So now in text, you will no longer you will no longer see different ways to spell one thing, right? Because for one word, there's one way to spell it. And 200 copies of the book look alike, right, in this period. So unlike the document that you read before, the Middle English text, you see only one way to spell one word, right? <coughs> Beginning in this period because of the printing press. Right? So thanks to William Caxton, the printing press got to England and then it made the printing of books easy, right? However, one thing that I have to say is that even though uh, you fix the spelling, so the printing press was responsible for fixing the spelling using the London dialect, right? Fix the spelling to be the same, right? And no changing. But language, as you know, keeps changing, right? Continuously. Uh, next week, or maybe this week, we'll talk about one great sound change. So sound changes are going on, but the spelling is fixed at this point, which means that we spell things these days, right? We spell things, but not the things that people sp spoke after that date. You understand what I'm saying? Which is, the, f the spelling is fixed, but the language, the pronunciation keep changing. So in a way, we are spelling the language that had not been spoken since that time, okay? Because the, the pronunciation kept changing, whereas the spelling was kept the same, right? Because of the printing press, right? Now, the second, the second uh, movement, which we call the Renaissance, right? You know that Renaissance is a cultural movement, right? It's cultural, it's a cultural and philosophical movement. So people went back to Greek and Latin sources, right? Went back to Greek and Latin authors, right? To draw from, right? In terms of literature, in terms of scientific discoveries, in terms of rhetoric, right? In terms of grammar. So this is the period of humanistic studies, right? Humanistic, just in Munde, right? So we study anything human in this period, right? So we study poetry, literature, rhetoric, the art of uh, public speaking, the art of persuasion, like that, Aristotle, Plato, like that, or philosophy, uh, also in this period, that's the Renaissance. So there's the revival, revive, making it come back to life again of classical, classical meaning Greek and Latin learning. So there were translations of Greek and Latin orders like Plutarch, Plato, Virgil, Ovid, and other, other guys, right? Other famous writers, philosophers. So we have a lot of influx of Latin and Greek, right, into English, uh, including very classical rhetoric. Rhetoric is the art of persuasion, the art of public speaking. So now English writers, English writers had access to classical rhetoric. So they, they can make arguments now. They can uh, achieve kind of flourish style that Greek writers or Roman writers used to have, right? So, and also we have a lot of loan words, right? Latin and Greek loan words here. And there's pressure to improve English because because once you, once you go back to English and Greek sources, you have to improve English so that it stands on the same level as Latin and Greek, right? So you have to borrow words, you have to uh, change the way you organize the paragraph and so on, change the way you uh, compose poetry and so on, right? So this is this period. And another movement is rising nationalism. Right. Oh, I think I must have skipped one. Yes, Protestant Reformation, which is also an Im important move um, in the English culture. Uh, Henry VIII, Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church in Rome. You know that at that time, 
every church was governed by the main church in Rome, right? The Pope. So governed every, every church in Europe. So uh, King Henry VIII broke away from that government, right? Governed by the church in Rome because he wanted to divorce his current wife, right? Then current wife, and he wanted to remarry it. But in Catholic, uh, in Catholic, you cannot do that, right? Divorce is not allowed in Catholicism. So, but he wanted to do it anyway. So what he did was he just broke away. So now there's no tie between the England church and he uh, crowned himself the church, the head of the church of England. So there's no tie between English and the, uh, the church in Rome anymore. So this, also coincided with Protestant Reformation at that time, right? Which means that uh, the church is no longer the authority in um, propagating religious thoughts, meaning that anyone should be able to read the Bible. Anyone, not only the monks, not only the priests, anyone should be able to read the Bible, right? Before this time, before the breakaway, before this time, translation of the Bible is illegal. You know that? Because it should be in Latin only, right? It should be in Latin only. Latin is the sacred language, right? The holy language. So anything that is translated is illegal until 1536, right? Of course, there would be people who violated that, but as we know, uh, when we study Middle English, remember Wycliffe's version of the Bible? That was illegal though, illegal, but people still translated the Bible illegally, right? But after this breakaway, it's no longer illegal, right? So you have the first version of the Bible, 1611 King James, King James Bible, which is the uh, legal version of the Bible, right? Legal version of the Bible. The 1536 Coverdale version is a printed version, but still not legal, right? But the legal one is 1611. 1536, that's the printed version by, by the printing press, right? The Wycliffe Bible that we study in Middle English, that was manuscript, illegal manuscript. 1350, thir uh, 1536 Coverdale version is the illegal printed version. 1611, the legal printed version. So now anyone can have access to religious thoughts, religious ideas, or teachings in the Bible, right? And the shift is towards English because most of the people at that time spoke English, right? And um, also it's school here, meaning that before learning, right, learning how to read and write uh, was done at the church, but now because anyone can have access to the Bible, anyone can learn and uh, write and learn uh, by themselves or by going to other types of school. And rising nationalism is also the uh, trend in that period. Uh, Elizabeth I was uh, the daughter of this guy, King Henry VIII, right? So she was the daughter, but uh, the Pope in Rome uh, didn't see her as the uh, rightful uh, daughter to become the Queen of England because, of course, the, the Pope didn't allow the divorce, right? But Henry VIII went ahead and got the divorce anyway, so he gave birth to um, Elizabeth I. So Pope in Rome didn't uh, approve that, so they excommunicated her. Excommunicated meaning, so they cut her, cut her away, right? Cut her off from any religious services, any communication with Rome. So when that happens, uh, there's rising nationalism, meaning that we no longer have to be under the government of Rome anymore, like that, right? So with that came the national pride in the English language, and there's the desire for national literature. She uh, was on the throne for a long, long time, and as you know, she supported all kinds of literature, right? Shakespeare, Marlowe, uh, 
all of those Renaissance writers, all of those Renaissance poets were under the support of this uh, queen, right? So this gave rise to a lot of literature in English, right? And um, she supported a lot of poets, a lot of writers. Right? But Latin still used in the Catholic Church right, at this time. So in Middle English, you had French, right? In Middle English, they had French, but in Modern English, early Modern English, you have the growing of nationalism in terms of the English language and literature, and also you have uh, Catholic, uh, you, you have Latin coming into English, right? Because of the Renaissance movement. And this is towards the end of the early modern English period. We have exploration and colonization. You, you know a lot about this, right? So before, before the 16th century, uh, England had only one overseas possession. It, it lost that uh, ultimately. However, uh, 30 years after that and by 1700, England had colonies around the world, right? Including Bermuda, including uh, British Virgin Islands, including the American colonies, including uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia, right? So all over the world by 1700. What does this mean to English? So English spread around the globe, right? And English also got a lot of loan words from those languages, right? From those languages that we were in contact with, like uh, Native American, and uh, Australian people, native Australian people, and so on. So we can talk about that when we talk about Englishes around the world, different types of English. So borrowing exotic products, when you, when you go to India and you see exotic food, exotic animals, when you go to America, you, you don't have the names for those things, right? So you have to uh, borrow all the terms that they call. The word skunk, which is an animal, that's from Native American, for example. And English was in contact with other languages, Indo-European languages, sometimes indigenous, like Australian, native Australian languages, or Native American languages. Right? And spread of English, we talked about that, as England had colonies around the world, right? in India, in Australia, and everywhere. And <clears throat> the last one, the last historical movement that I will mention, is in industrial revolution, right? Late 18th century, uh, pioneered by James Watt, right? Steam engine, he made it work better, right? So because of that, there were factory workers, right? Factory workers coming into London, right? Because they have to work in factories, right? And they had to stay together, right? So there's urbanization. You guys know the word urbanization in so urbanization, let's see. Um, urbanization, so urbanization. So London has become an urban, right? Meaning that it's um, a city where a lot of immigrants, hmm? a city where a lot of immigrants move into and it has become a major city now, uh, accommodating, accommodating people who, uh, who spoke different dialects, right? Who spoke different dialects. And with that also came a lot of technical vocabulary, uh, Latin and Greek roots, right? When you have to refer to uh, scientific discoveries, scientific parts, right? Scientific functions of things. You have to import words that English didn't have before. <clears throat> and literacy here, uh, um, contrary to what you may have expected, uh, you uh, perhaps had um, maybe a decrease of literacy uh, due to industrial revolution, because you know when people work for the for 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 the factories, uh, there was no law according to uh, which uh, a child can be uh, 
allowed to work at certain hours only. There was no law like that, unlike modern days, right? So there was child labor, right? The abuse of child labor at that time. And there was no law saying that you have to go to school at the age of three, four, five. There's no law like that. So this may affect literacy in a negative way, right? Because as people work, but only for workers though, only for workers, right? As people work for the, for the factories, there was no law uh, limiting their working conditions or, or the, the length of time. Um, so that might negatively affect uh, literacy, okay? So in terms of um, all of, uh, with the background of all those historical movements, now all those things affect in early modern English vocabulary, right? In a huge way. Of all periods in English, they say that early modern English demonstrates the fastest growth in vocabulary based on two criteria. One is objective, the other one is subjective, right? Objective meaning there is the need to express new ideas, right? Or ideas that are new to English. These are two different things, right? New ideas, new ideas that you come across in Greek and Roman sources, right? When you read uh, Plato, when you read Aristotle, there were some new ideas that you discover. So there's the need to express those new, uh, new ideas. And there's also the need to express ideas that are new to English when you go abroad, right? When you have colonies around the world, then you come across different things, right? Different animals, different ways of uh, governing the people, different ways of law, conducting the law. So here, these are ideas that are new to English, right? So English is in com competition with Latin in fields like medicine or law, new discoveries and new invention that we talked about, right? So those are uh, objective, right, objective. Also, there's the subjective need to borrow a lot of words from Latin and Greek. Subjective meaning depending on an individual, right, depending on an individual. Because people at that time were conscious of lower status of English relative to Latin, right, in relation to Latin, because English was poor, right, was poor in terms of words that we have, right? We don't have words to describe a lot of uh, scientific things or a lot of technical things, so we have to borrow from Latin. And this uh, made people uh, conscious of the status of English, right? So this is more subjective. To be prestigious, right? When we borrow a lot of words from Latin and Greek, we make English more prestigious in relation to Latin, right? Uh, usually loan words more influential than word formation. Right? In this period, in the early uh, phase of this period, initial phase of this period, loan words uh, are the major, major way of creating vocabulary in English. Right? But after that, it's back to word formation, like suffixing, uh, like compounding, and stuff like that. Okay? So these are two um, columns here that compare uh, classical languages, Latin and Greek, uh, with English and French vernacular languages, right, during the early modern English period in different uh, parameters. Orthography, spelling, right? In terms of spelling, Latin and Greek are uniform, right? There's one way to, f to spell a word, for example, so that's uniform, right, uniform. But English, as you saw in the Middle English text, that's not uniform. One word can be spelled many different ways, even by the same person. Vocabulary, superior, in, insufficient, right? So we don't have a lot of vocabulary to describe things, describe uh, philosophies, right? Philosophical thoughts and so on. So English, uh, uh, English is insufficient in comparison to Latin. Understood everywhere? Yes, for Latin and Greek, because this is like the international language of Europe at that time, right? international language of Europe at that time, so yes. Vernacular, uh, English and French understood everywhere, no, right? Because people communicated with Latin, right? If they were educated. Um, changing, no, there's no change for Latin and Greek because they are dead languages, right? Dead languages meaning no native speaker. And English keeps changing, right? 
feeling towards language perfect or uh, holy, meaning that they think that Latin and Greek are pure language, right? They, are, they think that people, people at that time thought that uh, Latin and Greek were pure, perfect languages because there were a lot of endings. There were a lot of inflections, right? And those inflections are still there, right? So they thought that these languages are perfect. But in fact, as we know, if you keep using the language, then the inflections will fall off at the end, right? But the reason why the inflections are there because nobody s spoke Latin and Greek as their first language, right? And um, they thought that English was imperfect because a lot of inflections were gone by Chaucer's time, by Middle English time, and so on. Who could use it? Only educated people, rich people, but English, because everyone else can use it, it didn't have that high status, right? Um, so with that, with this, right, with this, came what we call inkhorn or import terms. That's one question on your, on your final, because this is something that people need to know when they study, uh, when they study history of the English language. I don't know why this one is not working today, but so ing, inkhorn, let's see, inkhorn or ink pot terms. They refer to terms that, they refer to borrowed, borrowed words, right, loan words. They refer to borrow words that sound awkward, awkward, right? Loan words or borrow words that sound awkward. That sounds so spoken. Spoken language, not, uh, I'm sorry, uh, written, written, not spoken. That sounds so written, not spoken, not spoken language, right? As if, as if those words were from the writers that were writing, right? Inghorn is the container. At that time, we have to use the, the pen and the ink, right? And dip the pen in the ink and then you, you write. So inkhorn is the container of ink. Uh, container of ink, if you are rich, then it's made of horn, animal's horn, right? Or ink pot, same thing, right? So in those times, uh, people, uh, people had to dip, now, nowadays we don't, right? Because we have ballpoint pens. So those times people have to use ink. So people who are writing have to do a lot of inkhorn, right? Inghorning meaning like they have to dip a lot of uh, a lot of ink in order to write. So those loan words that sound awkward, as if they were coming straight from the pages of the book, right? As if they were writing rather than speaking, right? So those inghorn terms are terms that people, uh, a lot of people didn't approve, right? So uh, they they asked why borrow words from a dead language like Latin, right? So Inghorn and import terms are loan words that a lot of people disapprove of, right? Because they sound awkward and they sound like written language. And why, they ask, why you have to borrow words from a dead language, right? And this is different from earlier periods of borrowing because it's not from a living language, unlike French, right? You have that uh, borrowing because a lot of high class people were French, right? So that's living language. And number of borrowings were, like the number of borrowings here is a lot, right? Conscious and done by individual. This is more conscious than earlier period, right? And natural science, especially in scientific or in philosophical areas, right? And the borrowers are scholars, right? And show off scholars, sco people who want to look like they are educated, right? So. So this criticism comes under the name of inghorn or inkpot controversy, right? And inghorn or inkpot terms adapted to English. So all of these are Latin and Greek, right? On your left-hand side and on your right-hand side also from Latin and Greek. However, on the left side, those are the words or endings, uh, affixes that are lost. 
But on your right hand side, these are the endings or the affixes that we have adopted. Brevitas, right? Tas in Latin uh, became iti in English. So we use iti a lot, right? Activity and uh, many, many iti nouns, right? Uh, externas, nas becomes all, right? As becomes all in English. Ephemeros, rose becomes all, ephemeral in English. Andula, undulate. La becomes late. Ventriloquus becomes ventriloquis, like that. So these are uh, remnants of Latin borrowings, right? However, on the left hand side, they were lost. And you guys, these were import or inhorn terms in those times. But let's see, do you recognize, if you recognize these words or not? All of these words you should know because you are English majors. All of these words we use, uh, maybe in graduate studies, we see these words a lot, or even in undergraduate studies, right? Even for everyday life, gymnasium, gym, hanyang gym, right? Gym, gymnasium, that's not, not English though. Like, Chaos, you know, emphasis, genesis, uh, metathesis, we use that word, right? Monogram, right? Like how you put your initials on things, parentheses, right? Pathetic, right? You know most of these words though, right? Uh, aphrodisiac, adapt, illusion, complicate, dexterity, the skills of using two hands, um, expedite to make it faster, hereditary, running in the blood, Impersonal, mediate, jocular, joking, joking, jocular, typical, zealot, zeal, right? Like ardent uh, desire. You know, many, maybe 95% of these words. But these words were condemned as import, import, import or inhorn terms at that time, right? But these have been accepted, admitted into the English language, and they have been used just more or less commonly, as you can see, right? And um, doublets, again, doublets, um, the doublets are word of the words that share a common origin, right? However, however we may borrow them twice um, from different sources. In Middle English, in Middle English, we borrow, right? We borrow from French, so it's this, this column here. But in early modern English, we borrow from Latin. But you know, from French and Latin, they share the common root, which is Latin, right? So they look different, but they are from the same origin. And we borrow them twice at different times. So we have two words, right? Which we may use uh, in different contexts, but they share the same origin, right? And these are lost words that we, we uh, do not use anymore from Latin and Greek. I don't know the meaning either because we don't use them, right? And for or against, uh, for or against people who are for and people who are against, I'll ask you this question on the, and what, what is your idea? Uh, I'll ask you this on, on the final. People who are for, meaning for borrowing, right? People who support borrowing from Greek and Latin, they say that, oh, borrowing is just a natural process, right? Just like a natural process of borrowing that happens everywhere, that happens when a language is in contact with another language, so we should support it. And um, um, let's see, pedantry. Hmm? Let's see why the alignment is off here. Ah, the alignment is, is always off. Um, okay, so for natural process against purity of language, right? Because I use a Mac, a, a Mac uh, version of the Microsoft Word at home, so it's, everything is out of alignment here. So against purity of language, they think that language should be pure, right? Should be free from other foreign words. So they say that, oh, for the sake of purity of language, we should not do the borrowing. Right? We should not do the borrowing. Now, pedantry should be in this column. Pedantry should be against. Right? For, for those who are against, they think that it's pedantry, meaning that it sounds 
two pompous, you know, P-O-M-P-O-U-S, pompous, meaning it sounds arrogant. It sounds like you want to show off, right? Pedantry, hard to understand, and it sounds like you want to show off when you use a lot of borrow terms. Just imagine if you speak uh, English one word, and then the next word is Korean, and then you switch to English. People would think that, oh, you try to be um, cool, right? People would think that you are trying to be, you try to be uh, educated, right? So, so the against is pedantry, meaning that uh, it's hard to understand, and you sound like you want to show off your knowledge, right? But the four people would think newness will dissipate, meaning, oh, the newness, the pedantry of it will go away as we accept, as we admit them, and as we use them a lot, right? The newness will go away, right? And the newness went away for all of these words, right, that, that, that you guys know already. These are not new words anymore, right? The, the words that we look at before. These are ing pot or ing horn terms at, at that time, but the newness has gone away, right? For, for us, at least, right? And finally, uh, obscurity for against. Obscurity for against, uh, meaning that people think that uh, terms that are hard to understand, ing pot or ing horn terms, are hard to understand, so the meaning is obscure, right? The meaning is vague, is obscure, not clear. However, the four people, the four people say that words are understood in context, so there's no such thing as obscurity. So if you understand, as long as you understand the context, then words can be understood like that, okay? So there are two, two sides, right? Two sides arguing with each other. And this is an example. This is an example. They condemned a, a group of people, not, not a lot of, not, not everyone, right? Because there's the for people, there's the get against people. This is an example that they condemned. Like, if you use the language this way, the meaning will be obscure, the meaning will be vague, uh, and uh, it sounds like you want to show off your knowledge of the language and so on. So, do you think this obscures the meaning or not? Do you think that this sounds like you want to show off or not? Pondering, you guys know pondering, right? Pondering, thinking, expanding and revoluting with myself, your ingen affability and ingenious capacity for mundane affairs. Do you think that's uh, uh, obscure or not? The meaning is vague or not obscure, vague. I cannot but celebrate and extol, same thing, uh, your magnifico dexterity above all other for how you can have adapted such illustrate prerogative, we use this word, right, prerogative, privilege, and dominical superiority if the fecundity of your ingenie had not been so fertile and wonderfully pregnant. So do you think this is obscure or not? So that's your opinion. But most of these words you should know, right? Th these words may be new to, to the people at that time, but most of these words are not new anymore, and we use them a lot, right? Prerogative, dominical, superiority, fecundity, maybe you don't know, but um, in graduate school, you use that. Um, but all of these words, you know, right? Affability, this sociability of people like that, ingenious, genius, capacity, mundane, boring stuff, same, same shit, different days, like that. So all of these words, you know, right? But people still condemn this as being from ing pot or the ing pot or the ing horn, right? Two, two people in those days. But uh, maybe you think about this more and you can have your idea on the final exam whether you are for or whether you are against borrowing, right? Because this is not the issue for this period though. This is the issue for all the periods, right? Even nowadays, when you borrow new terms into English, you translate uh, to Korean, you translate them, right? Uh, terms that are linguistic, you translate them into Korean, right? So there must be people who want the Korean language to be pure, of, to be free of English also. It's not an issue that's specific to this period, right? So we'll come back on Wednesday and um, continue with early modern English.